While browsing on eBay for RCDs from China, not because I actually need RCDs from China, but I wanted to see what was available and take a look inside them, I came across this really incredibly neat one that's transparent. And this came from a seller called CGL3478 who sell all the Thomson stuff. Now, Thomson is uh, the one, I, that's the same supplier I got this from, this slightly dubious uh, overload, uh, the, the transient suppressor block that I didn't feel really cleared properly when it tripped. And they've got a whole range of these breakers. So I got two, and uh, this one's for another uh, video later. But uh, this one's a standard two module RCD or GFCI or GFI. And this one is uh, odd because it's a combined, well, I think this one, is this one an RCBO as well? Yes, it is. RCBO, which is the British terminology, which means residual current breaker with overload protection. That means it's not just uh, the earth leakage device. It also can detect a faulty load, uh, drawing too much current. It will trip. Standard RCDs uh, may have a rating like, say, 60 amp, 80 amp, but that may just be their normal current carrying rating. They may not have the facility to trip if a fault occurs. And it's quite dangerous when people use them thinking that they are going to break the circuit because uh, in the event of a fault, they will often explode. If you want to see an RCD exploding, uh, take a look at Mike's electric stuff. He took one to bits and uh, tested it to the point that it did actually explode and actually smashed the light fitting above his bench, which was really exciting. It really exploded, but uh, he was testing it to extreme levels. This one is really interesting because it's a standard circuit breaker. Well, I say standard, it's transparent, which is not standard. And uh, it's got an RCD trip mechanism in the side. And basically speaking, the power loops through this breaker uh, comes back up through, goes through the mechanism. And it's really quite, uh, quite interesting. It's nice that you can see the inside. The circuit board in here is really sparse. There's so little in it. Uh, I don't see anything obvious in the bottom of the circuit board, although there might be a little chip tucked away there somewhere. But the only other component, I can see four diodes, possibly forming a bridge. I can see some capacitors and other support components and a heavyish resistor, which might be a power supply resistor. And then just one small um, transistor-like package. It might be a transistor, thyristor. It could be a dedicated component specifically designed for RCDs, but with everything just stuffed into the one package. So, um, yeah, this is quite interesting. I think we need to investigate this. Um it's notable you can separate these and I have had them apart, but let's, uh, before I take them apart, let's test it. So I've got an RCD tester here, and here is an RCD set for 30 milliamps. My other one in line is um, 100 milliamps. So let's uh, see if we can trip this. So here's the tester. It's one of these annoying things that has an LCD display, and the LCD goes right up to the edge and you have to tilt to be able to see what text it has at the edge. It would be nice if they left a big margin. I suppose I really just wanted to stuff it as much as possible with uh, the, you know, the display. So I can select uh, the trip current as being 30 milliamp or 100 milliamp in this one. I can select the test whether it's going to be half the rate of trip current, five times the trip current or one time the trip current. So let's test it at half the trip current. It's passed. It didn't trip. Let's change the phase. Now, the phase is uh, whether it's a positive going uh, cycle that it trips on or the negative going cycle. So I'm going to change the phase. I'm going to run that test again. And it's passed. So let's uh, select the test. Let's put it up to one times. Uh, and we'll test in one phase. And it tripped in 20.8 milliseconds. Let's reset that. Select the other half of the phase, and it tripped in 12.6 milliseconds. It's kind of interesting. I wonder if it always trips consistently. That is quite a consistent... Uh... trip. That's interesting. I'm just going to test that a couple of times. Another one was longer. Yeah, 20 milliseconds on one half wave and about the, the much shorter time than the other. Okay, we've now ascertained that the test uh, works. So let's do it on this. I believe this is 30 milliamp. And to hook this up, let's uh, use this dubious test lead. 
So these, as always, are the sort of rising clamp terminals. As you tighten them, they rise up. And here's a little bugbear of mine, because this is really common on standard products we use here in the UK for installation. Uh, the problem I have is that when you tighten this up, if, it's, if you're doing it blind because it could be over a bus bar, then you could have that, you could sit that over a bus bar and not realise it would feel like it tightened up completely, but it's not actually gripped the wire. It, why do they do that? Um, it's one of these things you'd have thought they'd have regulated that they had to have the little tab that comes up after it to stop that happening. But uh, unfortunately, in the UK, all our electrical regulatory bodies are really just office workers. They don't actually get involved in doing electrical work. So someone has to actually tell them that before they do anything about it. It's not very good. So let's uh, test this by wiring in the live through the circuit breaker itself. So initially, the current flows through the actual circuit breaker, and it is just an ordinary circuit breaker stuck in the side of the trip mechanism. Then it comes out the circuit breaker, and it goes back up, and it goes through the sense circuitry. So here's the neutral going in here, and the earth will just bypass this completely because it only needs to monitor live and neutral to detect the fault. It's basically measuring the amount of current flowing along live and back through neutral. And if it sees a difference, it knows that something's leaked somewhere, either along the, the earth wire and the actual circuit, or fi finding another route to earth. Ooh. Actually, I might need a smaller... I will need a smaller screwdriver for that. That's odd. So here's the output. Some uh, circuit breakers do have, so where's that's the neutral over there. Some circuit breakers do have an extra earth wire on them and they use that to detect situations like live to earth faults, uh, sorry, neutral to earth faults. But um, it's not, it's, I don't think it's a requirement in the regulations. I think it's just an extra feature that some of the companies add in. It just makes it very messy wiring the distribution boards with those. So let's see, here is uh, the earth wires, which will just come in together because we'll need a return path for the fault current. So I'll put that into that commoning terminal. This is a Wago terminal. If you search my channel for Wago, you'll find these. I'll also remove that little paper label off the plug. Uh, all British plugs come with a little paper label that shows you how they should be wired. It's quite good, I suppose. So let's uh, plug this in. Set it uh, and test this. This is going to get a bit busy. Right, so let's uh, run the first test. Let's test at a half current. So select test. I'm going to set it to see, this is where you can hardly see what it says. Test. It's passed. Uh, select phase. Wait for it to come back. Select phase. Test. It's passed. So let's select the one times. Let's uh, make sure I get this right here. Trip, trip it. It did trip. Oh, okay. This is not resetting because a little tang has popped out here and you have to press it in to reset it. That's quite good. So let's uh, wait till this comes back. We'll test the other phase. And it tripped in that as well. So 26 milliseconds, press the reset. That's quite good. That means uh, the fact that little thing pops out means you know that it, if it doesn't pop out, that means it was an overload that tripped it. If it does pop out, it means that you've got a flag to say there was an earth leakage that tripped that. That's a very good feature. Let's test this again. 30 milliseconds. 30 milliseconds is actually getting... Getting on a bit, actually, in, in this uh, for this particular test. It should be, uh, I'm not sure, is it 20 milliseconds-ish is the recommended one, I suppose, ultimately, as long as it trips. Yeah, it's getting much lower in one half wave. I wonder if that's, uh, it, just like the other one, I wonder if that's just uh, the nature of the sort of circuitry. Yeah, consistently 19 milliseconds. Okay, so we have ascertained it trips in both half waves. Um, so let's uh, take it to bits now. Pop 
these wires out and then we'll pop the two sections apart pop that down somewhere out the way so I don't plug it in randomly uh, let's pop this screw out here and this one out here is that going to separate? oh yes it is, yep so it's very clear that that is just designed to go on to, you know, this on its own would just be a standard circuit breaker. But I wonder if you can then, oh yeah, it is, it's just got the, it's just got the standard hardware. So this on its own could be used as a standard circuit breaker. Let's take a look at that first. I'll zoom in a bit. I'm not sure how good this camera does zoom. Well, you can tell me or I'll see later on. So what have we got here? The mechanism. has a little plunger here and the coil. The, there are two trip mechanisms in these. One is thermal, and the thermal one is this bimetallic strip which carries all the current to the output. And if that gets too hot with a slow continuous overload, it bends up until it trips the little mechanism and uh, triggers the latch. Hold on, I can trigger this. Theoretically, by pushing that up. Yep, so thermally, the bimetallic strip bends up and undoes the latch. The other mechanism is for really high current short circuits. And there's a plunger here that uh, is through basically a solenoid, but a very coarsely wound solenoid because it passes all the current. And if there's a very high current fault, the plunger fires down, hits the other end of that tab and trips this. So uh, that's quite interesting. The area here with the sort of flame proofy type sort of paperish stuff uh, that's the uh, flash arrester because when the contacts open there, there can be a sort of arc drawn and that's all hidden actually which is a shame but when those contacts break any arc will uh, go into this area and it'll get quenched between all the metal plates and it will break the arc it's nice you can see the inside of this to see if there's anything really obvious happening or if the plastic would discolour if there was a fault in one of the terminals. That's very good, I like that. Here is the mechanism. The circuit board has nothing in the back of it. There's the mechanism. And when it trips, that little thing just pops up. And it, and it is a magnet just tripping that again. And that little flag, it, uh, it won't uh, go back down, allow that to reset until you click that back in. That's quite neat. Let's, uh, uh, let's not zoom out. Let's just stay right here because I am staying in shot. Let's go in further. Very intrigued by this circuitry. Is it a dedicated three pin chip that is doing all this? Uh, one thing I'm noting here is the way this senses the fault current, the leakage, it's got windings going through this toroidal core and the current is effectively, say, flowing out through the blue and then back through the red or vice versa. And each of them is wound round in such a way that the if the currents are equal, the load is normal, it will cancel any magnetic field out in the toroidal transformer. If there's an imbalance, it will induce magnetic flow in the toroidal transformer, which is picked up by this little sense coil with the two white wires here and triggers the mechanism this is going to pop to bits. This, this is spring-loaded. I can feel it already. It's going to go ping. I have a horrible feeling this may not be going back together. Another thing worth noting is, is that this is uh, not two modules wide, uh, or one module. It's uh, one and a half modules, quite an odd size. It's nice that they've got a generous spacing inside it, though. So I, I think I need to get this little thing out here. I need to get, oh, there we go. There we go. And this is where it really does all ping to bits. This is what I'm looking for, this little circuit board. I think I'm just going to have to pause momentarily and investigate this, so I'll be back in a moment. The deed has been done. It's been reverse engineered. It's all absolutely standard components, literally just a tiny smattering of standard components. It's times like this. I love taking cost-optimised Chinese stuff to bits because it's amazing. The circuitry is just frankly amazing. Wait till you see this. So I did the usual technique where I took a photo of the back of the circuit board, flipped it over, faded it out, and just drew the components on. Not many components to be bothered about. The standby current draw of this thing is zero. It's just staggeringly simple in its design. 
So we've got live and neutral uh, here, and the first thing that's across them is this big green thing. It's a metal oxide varistor. Shall we just, I know, we'll zoom in just a little bit so you can see this if you're not a small, portable mobile device. So you've got the metal oxide varistor across that to protect against voltage transients. Then you've got the trip coil here, which has a resistance uh, of 66 ohms. And uh, that's quite low because it's going to get dumped across the mains effectively when this uh, triggers. But that's going to result in a very, very brief but very high current, just enough literally just to snap that plunger in once and trip the mechanism. If the mechanism doesn't trip, then there's going to be trouble. But that's uh, in most instances, it should automatically trip the mechanism. And if uh, it doesn't, then the circuit will fail. But ultimately, that would have meant that it failed in the first place. So it's no great deal. The it goes through a trip coil, then it goes through a bridge rectifier made from four discrete 1N4007 diodes, one amp diodes, just conventional ones, that's these four diodes here. And then it goes to a thyristor, a super sensitive thyri gate thyristor, an MCR100-8, very common. And after that, it's the sense coil here, which has the uh, phase conductors, I've shown them going through it once, but they actually go through twice for extra oomph. And... Uh, Ultimately, the, the winding from that that's going to pick up the difference differential current just has a load resistor of 12K, presumably for some sort of calibration level, a 220 nanofarad capacitor to introduce a very slight time delay and to prevent false triggering of this, and a reverse priority protection diode, so that uh, that will also mean that in the event of uh, fault current flowing, it's not going to probably saturate this core. Could that happen? This coil, this uh, core is not suitable for DC faults. Not many are, uh, RCDs or GFCIs are. But basically speaking, you've got the current flowing out through this wire and coming back through this wire. And if they're balanced, if it's the same amount of current, nothing will be induced in this uh, magnetic core. But if something leaks to ground, so it's coming in through live, some of it's leaking to ground and not all of it's going back, you'll get an imbalance which will create a small voltage uh, here. And uh, after a very tiny delay, it'll trigger this thyristor. The thyristor will turn on and it latches on, it turns on, and will effectively shunt the supply rails, which will energize the trip coil and then kill the circuit. The test circuit is super simple. It's got this one resistor here, which is 3.3K. All it does is it goes from one side, which is a really common technique, one side of the coil to the other, so that when you press the button, it deliberately leaks current that bypasses the core between live and neutral. And again, the resistor would get very hot very quickly if you held that button and it was energized continually. But what actually happens is that when you press that in, the current uh, that th sees a fault current and it trips and it kills the circuit. It's absolutely incredibly simple. Uh, the current, the trip times I was getting were well within the standard British requirement, actually. The requirement in Britain is that at normal current, at the, say this is a 30 milliamp RCD, milliamp RCD, it should trip within 300 milliseconds. That seems quite a long time because let me assure you that if you get yourself into the situation that current is flowing through your body, 300 milliseconds, even though it's just one third of a second, will feel like a very, very long time. Uh, at five times that current, it should trip in 40 milliseconds, and that's a sort of that's a sort of minimum time it should trip in. This fulfilled that even though it was effectively only going to trigger on one half of the wave. I was under the impression that it had to trip within half a sine wave, but really they're just saying trip within, you know, best part of a sine wave. And this is just tripping in either less than the half or on the opposite polarity, it'll uh, be just over half a sine wave so it goes into the other polarity. Uh, that's very good. Um, that's really, really interesting. I love that circuit because it is so super simple. And the design in here is just chunky. It's because there's no really dense custom circuitry. It's just really neat. That is nice. I wonder if that's what it's in the other circuit breaker as well. I, I may have to take apart some other standard circuit breakers now just to see what they're like, the RCDs, GFCIs. But this is a yeah, I like that. That is very, very nice. I'm not going to say that you should rush out and buy these and install them because unfortunately there's that situation that uh, if there's an accident and they find that you got stuff cheap off eBay without the British or American or German or Australian European certification, then they're going to start pointing fingers as they do. 
But uh, this, I'm guessing, is perfectly acceptable for China and quite justifiably so. It certainly seems to do the job.